Hi, I'm Robbie Hart from Missouri Botanical Garden, and I'm really happy to be talking here at Vinh University in Hanoi. So we all know that climate change is having an effect around the entire world. Temperatures are rising, and the precipitation is changing, and natural events are getting more and more uncertain. But these effects are not happening at an equal rate around the entire world. Certain areas, like the Himalayas in Highland Asia, are experiencing the effects of climate change at rates of one and a half to one and three quarters times the global average change. And this is particularly important because these areas hold the headwaters of the major rivers that bring water to most of lowland Asia. As temperatures warm, there are direct effects on the environments, and there are also effects on glaciers, such as this one, which act as a natural sponge, soaking up water during the wet season and releasing it during the dry season. One microcosm of this broader change is the situation with Himalayan alpine vegetation. That is, flowers and other plants that occur above the tree line, the elevational limit above which uh, trees and other woody plants can't grow. This vegetation is particularly important because it's not just of interest to biologists, botanists, people who care about biodiversity, but it also constitutes useful plants and landscapes for local people across the Himalayan region. So this can include uh, being um, part of alpine pasture for yaks and cows, being a source of important medicinal herbs and other sources of natural products that are harvested for people's livelihoods, and constituting a sacred space such that climate-driven changes to alpine vegetation constitute not only a material change, but a spiritual and cosmological change. So I want to talk today about some work to address these sorts of changes that I'm undertaking with a diverse team of colleagues. So this includes um, not just me, of course, but my uh, compatriots, uh, Fong Zhendong at Shangri-La Alpine Botanical Garden, Suresh Gamire at Tribhavan University, uh, Sangay Dema and Choki Gelchen at the National Biodiversity Center of Bhutan, and Dr. Jan Salek, who originally began this research and um, who was one of my graduate mentors when I was a student. It also inclu includes other researchers and participants from lots of different places. So it includes workers at botanical gardens and biodiversity centers. It includes a lot of graduate students, particularly in Nepal. And it includes the local people around the sites where we work, who, because this is a long-term project, have been included in, in the project for years and years. So how do we go about this research to track the effects of climate change on alpine ecosystems and particularly alpine flora? So we're employing a method known as GLORIA, which is short for the Global Observational Research Initiative in Alpine Environments. This is a shared global methodology uh, that's now being undertaken at more than 100 site mountain sites around the entire world so that our results can be contextualized within the results of our uh, colleagues from essentially every other major mountain region around the world. It's a long-term monitoring program, so we set up sites and then with the plan to revisit them again and again and again to gather data that's at the same sort of temporal scale or longitude as climate change itself. It also takes place across an elevational gradient. So for the Gloria method, we work at four mountain summits within a target area region. This starts at the low alpine to subalpine ecotone, which is a uh, um, imaginary dividing line between two uh, elevationally defined ecosystems. So the subalpine would be down where the last woody plants, trees, and big shrubs grow. Uh, and then the low alpine is just above that. Um, so this is our lowest summit. Uh, at our sites in the Himalayas, this is around 4,000 meters above uh, sea level, and it looks something like this. Our highest summit is at the nival subnival ecotone. The nival e uh, ecosystem is defined as the area beyond which any plants can grow. So these are very high summits, 
For us, it's around 5,000 meters in elevation, and it looks something like this. And then at most of the sites, we also have summits uh, in between, one or two summits in between. So using these, we can see how the changes in temperature across elevation uh, characterize alpine flora and track both those changes in temperature and the changes in plants as an ongoing effect of climate change. Um, and we're working right uh, at the tree line. This is an example of the tree line um, at one of our lowest summits uh, from work I recently conducted just this last fall. Uh, this is at uh, Manong in Nepal. And you can see some of the highest elevation birch forests in the world here with our uh, lowest summit just above it. Uh, of course, to get up to these summits, uh, even once we're at a high elevation base camp, requires a lot of climbing up mountains. So we do a lot of this on every one of these field sites. And as I narrated in this video, it's difficult to hold your breath uh, at these elevations. It's difficult to get enough oxygen, but it's very rewarding work. Once we're there, a lot of our work entails uh, doing a lot of measurement, a lot of laying down of string, because as ecologists, we care about defining the areas we work in very exactly so that we can uh, look for small changes in plants that require us to make sure that we're comparing apples and oranges between a site that we surveyed, say, 11 years ago and a site we surveyed this year. So um, this is a, a schematic of what one of these summits looks like. Um, so we're starting at the top of the summit and measuring down 10 meters and surveying all the plants within this area, installing temperature loggers that record temperature data on each of the aspects, um, or at least north and south aspects, and then doing intensive quantitative surveys of each plant species' presence and absence in these small one by one meter plots. So it looks something like this when we're actually doing it. Uh, this is the summit I just showed you a moment ago with the birch forest below it at Manang. And here's the team gathering data within these one by one meter plots. Uh, we also, because we're working from at botanical gardens as botanists, care about making sure we identify plants exactly. That we're sure if we think there's been a change in species that we're talking about the same species that a former team saw seven or 10 or 15 years previously. So to do that, we collect plant specimens. Um, this is uh, my colleague Shivaram collecting plant specimens just outside the border of our plot because we don't want to change what's happening within the plot um, so that they can be preserved and compared later for accurate identification. We go away, and the plot is seemingly an otherwise normal summit but we're recording hourly temperature um, from each of these temperature loggers. So this is tens of thousands of hourly temperature recordings that then we can bring to bear on looking at the question of how temperatures actually affect which plants occur on these mountain summits. And so this is something that's all shared with the global Gloria methodology. What we add to it uniquely is looking at local and indigenous perspectives on climate change as well. And this answers a little bit of the question of, you know, why exactly should we care about these changes? You know, if, if some species shift on a mountain summit, what does it matter to people? So we're doing a lot of interviews. Uh, here you can see Yegya Paneru, um, uh, formerly a student, now a colleague of mine, now that he's graduated, uh, conducting interviews um, with uh, uh, members of the uh, Tamang uh, minority group in, at one of our sites in Nepal about the uses and names of this plant we collected here. So these are basic ethnobotanical interviews about how a plant is used. We also do more involved participatory methods, uh, such as constructing maps, calendars, and looking back at archival pictures to try to include local people in our work and elicit more context. Um, so some of the basic data we get looks something like this. Uh, so here are four species that are shared across several of the glorious sites that we work at, at our sites in China, Bhutan, and Nepal, um, and the different ways or similar ways that they're used at these different sites. However, when we add some more context to this, 
we can start to ask whether there's really a match between what we see as ecologists, so this is my colleague Choki Gelchin with one of our measuring frames, um, and what local people uh, experience uh, as they're engaging with the environment, perhaps gathering natural resources, uh, or whether there's a match between what our temperature loggers are recording um, as machines, recording hourly temperature that they experience right where they're installed, and local perceptions, such as earlier it used to rain from June to August, today it rains from February to October. This was information that we uh, gathered at our most recent trip to um, one of our sites in Bhutan, and we were able to confirm that it is indeed very rainy in October. <laughs> We also experience this sort of duality of the experience of a place as both natural scientists collecting information about it, but also people interested in you know, being part of the environment and interacting with local people and local places at a deeper level. So we collect plants, we identify them. Um, this is our site in Bhutan, where uh, inside this green tent here, we're pressing plants, we're consulting printed resources um, about scientific Latin names of the plants to make sure we have accurate identifications. And we're archiving them uh, to be stored at scientific facilities elsewhere. However, outside, some of the same plants were avidly engaging in the local custom of burning these plants, in this case rhododendron, to propitiate the mountain gods here and try to make sure that we have good weather for our field work up on this mountain range the next day. Um, and we're recording information about this uh, um, tradition that we're participating in as well. So when we set up one of these sites, then we'll leave for five years, for seven years, for 10 years, in some cases for 11 or 12 years, uh, and then come back to try to relocate the exact site. And this can often be like a bit of a treasure hunt. Uh, we install uh, metal markers on various marker points around each one of the sites. Uh, to mark it. They're buried in the ground, though, so we can't see them. We take GPS points, but GPS is only so accurate. And we have lots and lots of photo recordings and measurements of the site as well. But it usually requires all of these to really find the site. So I believe this uh, video is of us finally using a metal detector to find the buried metal stake at one of our sites in Bhutan on this most recent trip. Joyful that we finally found this. This is a picture of us at our most recent field work in Nepal, consulting our documentary photographs from 11 years earlier to try to relocate the exact rock uh, below which we buried one of our marker stakes. But as a reward for doing this work, you know, this is a lot harder work than it takes to gather the same sort of information at a permanent field station, working out of buildings, working with defined permanently marked sites. Um, but as a reward, we get to record unique data that's nowhere else in the world. This is some of temperature data from uh, one of our sites in Bhutan, near the sacred mountain Jomalhari, um, where we were able to recover temperature loggers that had recorded data from 2011 to 2017, show rapid warming of more than a degree per decade, um, show that the warming was consistent at our low elevation summit, uh, which was 4,100 meters, and our high elevation summit, which was 4,500 meters. And this was particularly exciting to me because this is temperature information that wasn't available elsewhere because the closest weather station had only been installed in 2015 or so. All of the temperature information before that was completely unique. So what are our results that we're seeing so far? Of course, this is a long-term study, and we don't know yet what the future will show. But based on what we've recorded so far, we were able to see that with increasing temperatures, at the scale of a given plot, we're actually seeing more plants. So uh, at some of our Chinese sites that we were able to quantitatively analyze first, we saw that richness, that is the number of plant species, was increasing at 1.8 species per plot. This is, this is quite a bit. So these mountain areas are greening up as the temperatures get warmer and more hospitable. However, we're also able to see a sign that lower elevation species 
are extending their ranges upwards. So species that were currently only able to survive at lower elevations now can survive at higher elevations in the more hospitable temperatures. And this is a concern because plants that live in the alpine environment are particularly adapted to cold temperatures and they're often thought to not be well adapted to competing with lower elevation plants. So uh, the worry is, and what we've been able to quantitatively model as well, is that over longer time scales, as temperature continues to increase as a result of climate change, we'll have these sky islands, these alpine areas with this unique plant richness found nowhere else in the world, shrinking as essentially the sea level of the forests rise up um, and lower elevation species are able to move upwards. So we published some of these results recently in the American Journal of Botany. Um, this is uh, Fong and me on the cover at one of our sites in uh, southwest China. And um, you can scan the QR code to take a look at that article if you want. Um, and so if what we're seeing, though, is more plants in the short term, we might ask the question, how does this affect local people? Perhaps they're seeing more plant resources of these resources that they rely on for medicinal plants, livelihood plants, food plants, fodder plants. In fact, that's not the case, and that's not the result that we're seeing from our interview and other participatory methods. Um, so when we conducted interviews recently in Bhutan, um, people reported increases in temperatures, increases in precipitation and more variability in precipitation, a decrease in snowpack, causing mountains to be exposed to more landslides, and significant decreases in the health of the yak herds that they relied on, particularly in this area where we were asking questions. So in terms of plant natural resources, what they observed was increasing unpredictability. So the fact that we, as natural scientists, were able to observe small but measurable increases in plant biomass didn't affect what was actually available to local people and usable by them if they couldn't predict where it would occur, when it would occur, what the chemical qualities and functional qualities of the plants would be. Um, and so this increasing unpredictability is not limited just to the Himalaya. This is something that's been a repeated result of research into climate change effects on local resources and local people's dependence on those resources across the entire world. This is plant resources, animal resources, and other environmental resources. Um, however, local people here in the Himalaya and everywhere across the world are not just helpless victims of climate change, right? They're responding to it, they're adapting to it, and they're experimenting. Um, so in the areas that we work in, we've been able to document people bringing in new crops and new crop varieties to experiment with crops that are especially suited to the changing and the new temperatures. Um, we've uh, observed and also been able to help with experiments with cultivation instead of wild collection. So when we're able to document climate-driven threats to, for instance, a rare wild plant species that's collected as medicine, we can suggest, look, uh, this plant's population, the number of the plant species on the mountain, is being negatively affected by both climate change and by harvest, perhaps over-harvest by local people. Can we bring this into cultivation and leave the wild populations to recover? And so uh, several of our students we've advised, master students that we've advised in Nepal, for instance, have been engaged in just this sort of work. We're also able to suggest new sustainable collection strategies, and in some cases, culturally acceptable alternatives to wild harvested plants, again, to let natural populations recover and have a resilience to the effects of climate change. Uh, my colleague Suresh Gamire in Nepal has recently co-authored a book with local AMCHI, local doctors there, uh, suggesting um, from both the perspective of a botanist and the perspective of a traditional plant doctor, what alternative plant medicines would be that come from populations that are robust and under no threat. So then, where do we go forward from here? It's a long-term project. We're continuing to survey these sites. We're continuing to add more sites. 
And we're continuing to work within the greater collective of Gloria to do global analyses to really characterize how climate change is affecting all mountain regions around the world and the plants that occur there. For our own sites, we want to continue to let local perceptions not just answer local questions for us, but really guide our ecological methods. So to try to take the sorts of methods that we're trained in as natural scientists and use those to answer questions that come from local perceptions and local problems. We also want to build local capacity for long-term monitoring. In each of the countries where we work, we work with local partners at a national level, but there are smaller and smaller circles of locality. And um, if we really want these projects to be long-term and to match the long-term nature of climate change itself, we need to be engaging more and more uh, local people into the monitoring project itself. And that's something we're trying to do as we move forward. Finally, we really want to use this data not just to record a negative change that's happening, but to support adaptation and conservation um, in mountain sites around the world. And that's something I think that we can do particularly well when we have this global voice of all of the researchers working around the world in mountain ecosystems who have adopted this shared method and um, are able to bring to their respective decision makers, be it park managers, local people, policy makers, uh, global governments. Um, the results we're finding, the data and the actual changes that we're observing, and then our suggestions and examples of adaptation methods. Thank you so much for your time. It's really a pleasure to be here at Vin University. And I'm happy to um, take questions uh, if you want to find out more about me, uh, find out contact information for me, um, read more of the work I've published, or send me questions by email uh, or social media. You'll find me here at this QR code.